friends. Good evening. How you doing? Hello. How are you? I have a little bit of laundry behind me. That's cute. Let's scoot this actually a little bit. I'm trying to reposition. Hi. Hi, friends. a little bit so I can see everything hello Riddy hello Bacon, hello Angel, hello Rob how you guys doing? hope you guys can hear everything okay <laughs> I meant to put a space in there I went. I meant to put a space it's all good, um, I hope you guys can hear me um, I'm not going to talk very loud right now I will get I'm sure I will get louder while reading um, I want you guys still to be able to hear the music very very softly behind me so just let me know Hello. I can't do it as well as Tara. Okay, cool. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Great to be here as always. Um, I am... Oh, that's okay, Bacon. Um, I appreciate you being here for any amount of time that you can be. Um, I'm a little bit... <clears throat> still from my sickness, so forgive me if I'm drinking waters and clearing my throat. I say waters. I guess technically when you drink water, you're drinking lots of drops of waters, so that's still appropriate. I'm glad you love this book. This is my favorite series of books ever. second. <laughs> Down with the sickness. Sorry, I got a text. I'm good. Sorry. Well, thank you so much. For the host, Summer, how are you doing this evening? Okay. I'm going to read at least four chapters tonight. I might read five. So we'll see. <clears throat> okay. go ahead and jump on in animal crossing music i like this compilation okay without further ado um chapter five the expression following suit is a curious one because it has nothing to do with walking behind a matching set of clothing if you follow suit it means you do the same thing somebody else has done if all of your friends decided to jump off a bridge into the icy waters of an ocean or river, for instance, and you jumped in right after them, you would be following suit. You can see why following suit can be a dangerous thing to do. 
because you could end up drowning simply because someone else thought of it first. This is why, when Violet stood up from the hay and said, How do you do, Coach Genghis? Klaus and Sonny were reluctant to follow suit. It was inconceivable to the younger Baudelaire's that their sister had not recognized Count Olaf and that she hadn't leapt to her feet and informed Vice Principal Nero what was going on. For a moment, Klaus and Sonny even considered that Violet had been hypnotized, as Klaus had been back when the as Klaus had been back when the Baudelaire orphans were living in Paltryville. But Violet's eyes did not look any wider than they did normally, nor did she say how did you how do you do, Coach Genghis, in a dazed tone of voice that Klaus had used when he had been up under hypnosis. But although they were puzzled, the younger Baudelaire's trusted their sister absolutely. She had managed to avoid marrying Count Olaf when it had seemed it would be inevitable, a word which here means a lifetime of horror and woe. She had made a lockpick when they'd needed one in a hurry and had used her inventing skills to help them escape from some very hungry leeches. So even though they could not think what the reason was, Klaus and Sonny knew that Violet must have had a good reason to greet Count Olaf politely rather than reveal him instantly, and so after a pause, they followed suit. How do you do, Coach Genghis? Klaus said. Gaffito, Sonny shrieked. It's a pleasure to meet you, Coach Genghis said and smirked. The Baudelaire's could tell he thought he had fooled them completely and was very pleased with himself. What do you think, Coach Genghis? Vice Principal Nero said. Do any of these orphans have the legs you're looking for? Coach Genghis scratched his turban and looked down at the children as if they were all an all-you-can-eat salad bar instead of five orphans. Oh, yes, he said in the wheezy voice the Baudelaire still heard in their nightmares. With his bony hands, he pointed first at Violet, then at Klaus, and lastly at Sonny. These three children here are just what I'm looking for, all right. I have no use for these twins, however. Neither do I, Nero said, not bothering to point out that the Quagmires were triplets. He then looked at his watch. Well, it's time for my concert. Follow me to the auditorium, all of you, unless you're in the mood to buy me a bag of candy. The Baudelaire orphans hoped never to buy their vice principal a gift of any sort, let alone a bag of candy, which the children loved and hadn't eaten in a very long time. So they followed Nero out of the orphan shack and across the lawn to the auditorium. The quagmires followed suit, staring up at the gravestone buildings which looked even spookier in the moonlight. This evening, Nero said, I will be playing a violin sonata I wrote myself. It only lasts about a half hour, but I will play it twelve times in a row. Oh, good, Coach Genghis said. If I may say so, Vice Principal Nero, I am, an, I am an enormous fan of your music. Your concerts were one of the main reasons I wanted to work here at Proof Rock Prep. Well, it's good to hear that, Nero said. It's difficult to find people who appreciate me as genius as I am. I know the feeling, Coach Genghis said. I'm the finest gym teacher the world has ever seen, and yet there hasn't even been one parade in my honor. Shocking, Nero said, shaking his head. The Baudelaire's and the Quagmires, who were walking behind the adults, looked at one another in disgust at the braggy conversation they were overhearing, but they didn't dare speak to one another until they arrived at the auditorium, taking seats as far away as possible from Carmelita Spatz and her loathsome friends. There is one, and only one advantage to somebody who cannot play the violin insisting on doing so anyway, and the advantage is that they often play so loudly that they cannot hear if the audience is having a conversation. It is extremely rude, of course, for an audience to talk during a concert performance, but when the performance is a wretched one and lasts six hours, such rudeness can be forgiven. So it was for that evening, for after introducing himself with a brief, braggy speech, Vice Principal Nero stood on the stage of the auditorium and began playing his sonata for the first time. When you listen to a piece of classical music, it's often amusing to try and guess what inspired the composer to write those particular notes. Sometimes a composer will be inspired by nature and will write a symphony imita imitating the sounds of birds and trees. Other times a composer will be inspired by the city and will write a concerto imitating the sounds of traffic and sidewalks. In the case of this sonata, Nero had apparently been inspired by somebody beating up a cat because the music was loud and screechy and made it quite easy to talk during the performance. As Nero sawed away at his violin, the students of Proof Rock Prep began to talk amongst themselves. The Baudelaire's even noticed Mr. Ramora and Mrs. Bass, who were supposed to be figuring out which students owed Nero bags of candy, giggling and sharing a banana in the back row. Only Coach Genghis, who was sitting in the center of the very front row, seemed to be paying any attention to the music. Our new gym teacher looks creepy, Isadora said. That's for sure, Duncan agreed. 
It's that sneaky look in his eye. That sneaky look, Violet said, taking a sneaky look herself to make sure Coach Genghis wasn't listening in, is because he's not really Coach Genghis. He's not really any coach. He's Count Olaf in disguise. I knew you recognized him, Klaus said. Count Olaf, Duncan said. How awful! How'd he follow you here? Staywalk, Sunny said glumly. My sister means something like he follows us everywhere, Violet explained, and she's right. But it doesn't matter how he found us, the point is that he's here, and that he undoubtedly has a scheme to snatch our fortune. But why did you pretend not to recognize him, Klaus asked. Yes, Isadora said. If you told Vice Principal Nero that he was really Count Olaf, then Nero could throw the cake sniffer out of here, if you'll pardon my language. Violet shook her head to indicate that she disagreed with Isadora and that she didn't mind about cake sniffer. Olaf's too clever for that, she said. I knew that if I tried to tell Nero that he wasn't really a gym teacher, he would manage to wiggle out of it, just as he did with Aunt Josephine and Uncle Monty and everybody else. That's good thinking, Klaus admitted. Plus, if Olaf thinks he's fooled us, it might give us some more time to figure out exactly what he's up to. Lert, Sunny pointed out. My sister means that we can see if any of his assistants are around, Violet translated. And that's a good point, Sunny. I hadn't thought of that. Count Olaf has assistants? Violet asked, or Isadora asked. That's not fair. He's bad enough without people helping him. His assistants are as bad as he is, Klaus asked. There are two powder-faced women who forced us to be in his play. There's a hook-handed man who helped Olaf murder our Uncle Monty. And the bald man who bossed us around at the lumber mill. Don't forget him, Violet added. Aganu, Sunny asked, which meant something like, and the assistant that looks like neither a man nor a woman. What does Aganu mean? Duncan asked, taking out his notebook. I'm going to write down all these details about Olaf and his troop. Why? Violet asked. Why? Isadora repeated. Because we're going to help you, that's why. You don't think we'd just sit here while you tried to escape from Count Olaf's clutches, would you? But Count Olaf is very dangerous, Klaus said. If you try and help us, you'll be risking your lives. Never mind about that, Duncan said, although I'm sorry to tell you that the Quagmire triplets should have minded about that. They should have minded very much. Duncan and Isadora were very brave and caring to try to help the Baudelaire orphans, but bravery often demands a price. By price, I do not mean something along the lines of five dollars. I mean a much, much bigger price. A price so dreadful I cannot speak of it now, but must return to the scene I'm writing at this moment. Never mind about that, Duncan said. What we need is a plan. Now we need to prove to Nero that Coach Genghis is really Count Olaf. How do we do that? Nero has that computer, Violet said thoughtfully. He showed us a little picture of Olaf on the screen, remember? Yes, Klaus said, shaking his head. He told us that the advanced computer system would keep Olaf away. So much for computers. Sunny nodded her head in agreement, and Violet picked her up and put her on her lap. Nero had reached a particularly shrieky section of his sonata, and the children had to lean forward to one another in order to continue their conversation. If we go and see Nero first thing tomorrow morning, Violet said, we can talk to him alone without Olaf butting in. We'll ask him to use the computer. Nero might not believe us, but the computer should be able to convince him to at least investigate Coach Genghis. Maybe Nero will take him off the, make him take off his turban, Isadora said, revealing Olaf's only eyebrow. Or take off those expensive looking running shoes, Klaus said, revealing Olaf's tattoo. But if you talk to Nero, Duncan said, then Coach Genghis will know that you're suspicious. That's why we'll have to be extra careful, Violet said. We want Nero to find out about Olaf without Olaf finding out about us. And in the meantime, Duncan said, Isadora and I will do some investigating ourselves. Perhaps we can spot one of these assistants you've described. That would be very useful, Violet said, if you're sure about wanting to help us. Say no more about it, Duncan said and patted Violet's hand. <clears throat> and they said no more about it. They didn't say another word about Count Olaf for the rest of Nero's sonata or while he performed it for the second time or the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time or even the sixth time, by which time it was very, very late at night. The Baudelaire orphans and the Quagmire triplets merely sat in a companionable, companionable comfort, a phrase which here means many things, all of them happy, even though it is quite difficult to be happy while hearing a terrible sonata performed over and over by a man who cannot play the violin, while attending an atrocious boarding school with an evil man sitting nearby, undoubtedly planning something dreadful. But, 
Happy moments came rarely and unexpectedly in the Baudelaire's lives, and the three siblings had learned to accept them. Duncan kept his hand on Violet's and talked to her about terrible concerts he'd attended back when the Quagmire parents were still alive, and she was happy to hear his stories. Isadora began working on a poem about libraries and showed Klaus what she had written in her notebook, and Klaus was happy to offer suggestions. And Sunny snuggled down in Violet's lap and chewed on the armrest of her seat, happy to bite something that was so sturdy. I'm sure you would know, even if I didn't tell you, that things were about to get much worse for the Baudelaire's, but I will end this chapter with this moment of companionable comfort, rather than skip ahead to the unpleasant events of the next morning or the terrible trials of the days that followed, or the horrific crime that marked the end of the Baudelaire's time at Proof Rock Prep. These things happened, of course, and there's no use pretending they didn't, but for now, let us ignore the terrible sonata, the dreadful teachers, the nasty, teasing students, and the even more wretched things that will be happening soon enough. Let us enjoy this brief moment of comfort, as the Baudelaire's enjoyed it in the company of the Quagmire triplets, and in Sonny's case, an armrest. Let us enjoy at the end of this chapter, the last happy moment that any of these children would have for a long, long time. It's the end of chapter five. Let me catch up. Bye, Bacon, even though you're not here to see, help, to hear me say bye. Ooh, the popcorn. Hey, Stuart, thank you so much for the host again. How are you doing tonight? Great to see you. Hey, Timo, how are you? Ooh, sour Skittles. Partakes gratefully and with puckered lips. <laughs> Sorry about curry. Sonata written inspiration from a cat don't drink kids V voice though oh that's sweet the Voldemort prize spoilers Happy moments come rarely in the three orbs lives, just like the happy ending that will be the end of the series. I'm determined. I'm hopeful. He literally says in the beginning of the first book, this story has no happy ending, no happy beginning, and very few happy things in the middle. He warned you. <laughs> Coming over to Scotland to be your supervisor. Throwing <laughs> logs. You've been up since 4 a.m.? Dude, go to bed. <laughs> he can say what he wants. One moment, I got another text. This music, though. Mm. Okay. <laughs> You're with... He does not, however, warn against a joyful and overwhelmingly glad ending. I see right through that lemony snicket. You're with Rob? Okay! I'm just gonna read them. <laughs> and now my mother just texted me.
Shake your head all you like. I believe what I believe. Okay. Chapter six. <laughs> Already. <laughs> Chapter six. What is my mom texting me about? Okay. Proof Rock Preparatory School is now closed. It has been closed for many years. Ever since Mrs. Bass was arrested for bank robbery, and if you were to visit it now, you would find it an empty and silent place. If you walked on the lawn, you would not see any children running around, as there were, as there were the day the Baudelaire's arrived. If you walked by the building containing the classrooms, you would not hear the droning voice of Mr. Ramora telling a story, and if you walked by the building containing the auditorium, you would not hear the scrapings and shriekings of Vice Principal Nero playing the violin. If you went and stood beneath the arch, looking up at the black letters spelling out the name of the school and its austere, a word which here means stern and severe, motto, you would hear nothing but the swish of the breeze through the brown and patchy grass. In short, if you went and visited Prufrock Preparatory School today, the academy would look more or less as it did when the Baudelaire's woke up early the next morning and walked to the administrative building to talk to Nero about Coach Genghis. The three children were so anxious to talk to him that they got up especially early, and as they walked across the lawn, it felt as if everyone else at Prufrock Prep had slipped away in the middle of the night, leaving the orphans alone amongst the tombstone-shaped buildings. It was an eerie feeling, which is why Violet and Sunny were surprised when Klaus broke the silence by laughing suddenly. What are you snickering at? Violet asked. I just realized something, Klaus said. We're going to the administrative building without an appointment. We'll have to eat our meals without silverware. That's not, there's nothing funny about that, Violet said. What if they serve oatmeal for breakfast? We'll have to scoop it up with our hands. Oot, Sunny said, which meant, trust me, it's not that difficult. And at that, the Baudelaire sisters joined their brother in laughter. It was not funny, of course, that Nero enforced such terrible punishments, but the idea of eating oatmeal with their hands gave all three siblings the giggles. Or fried eggs, Violet said. What if they serve runny fried eggs? Or pancakes covered in syrup, Klaus said. Soup, Sunny shrieked, and they all broke out in laughter again. Remember that picnic, Violet said. We were going to Rutabaga River for a picnic, and Father was so excited about the meal he, that he made, he forgot to pack silverware. Of course I remember, Klaus said. We had to eat all that sweet and sour shrimp with our hands. Sticky, Sunny said, holding her hands up. It sure was, Violet agreed. Afterward, we went to wash our hands in the river, and we found a perfect place to try the fishing rod I made. And I picked blackberries with Mother, Klaus said. Irus, Sunny said which meant something like, and I bit rocks. The children stopped laughing now, as they remembered that afternoon, which hadn't been so very long ago, but it felt like it had happened in the distant, distant past. After the fire, the children had known their parents were dead, of course, but it had felt like they had merely gone away somewhere and would be back before long. Now remembering the way the sunlight had shone on the water of Rutabaga River, and the laughter of their parents as they'd made a mess of themselves eating the sweet and sour shrimp. The picnic seemed so far away that they knew their parents were never coming back. Maybe we'll go back there, Violet said quietly. Maybe someday we could visit the river again and, and catch fish and pick blackberries. Maybe we can, Klaus said. But the Baudelaire's all knew that even if someday they went back to Rutabaga River, which they never did, by the way, that would it would not be the same. Maybe we can, but in the meantime, we've got to talk to Nero. Come on, here's the administrative building. The Baudelaire sighed and walked into the building, surrendering the use of proof rock prep silverware. They climbed the stairs to the ninth floor and knocked on Nero's door, surprised that they could not hear him practicing the violin. Come in if you must, Nero said, and the orphans walked in. Nero had his back to the door, looking at his reflection in the window as he tied a rubber band around one of his pigtails. When he was finished, he held both his hands up in the air. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Principal Nero, he announced, and the children began applauding obediently. Nero whirled around. I only expected to hear one person clapping, he said sternly. Violet, Klaus, you're not allowed up here, you know that. I beg your pardon, sir, 
Violet said, but all three of us have something very important we need to discuss with you. All three of us have something very important we need to discuss with you, Nero replied in his usual nasty way. It must be important for you to sacrifice your silverware privileges. Well, well, out with it. I have a lot of rehearsing to do for my next concert, so don't waste my time. This won't take long, Klaus promised. He paused before continuing, which is a good thing to do if you're choosing your words very, very carefully. We are concerned, he continued, choosing his words very, very carefully, that Count Olaf may have somehow managed to get to Prufrock Prep. Nonsense, Violet, er, Nero said. Now go away and let me practice the violin. But it might not be nonsense, Violet said. Olaf is a master of disguise. He could be right under our very noses and we wouldn't know it. The only thing under my nose, Nero said, is my mouth, which is telling you to leave. Count Olaf could be Mr. Remora, Klaus said, or Mrs. Bass. Mr. Remora and Mrs. Bass have taught at the school for 47 years, Nero said dismissively. I would know if one of them was in disguise. What about the people who work in the cafeteria? Violet asked. They're always wearing those metal masks. Those are for safety, not for disguises, Nero said. You brats have some very silly ideas. Next, you'll be saying that Count Olaf has disguised himself as your boyfriend. What's his name, the triplet? Violet blushed. Duncan Quagmire is not my boyfriend, she said, and he's not Count Olaf either. But Nero was too busy making idiotic jokes to listen. Who knows, he said, and then laughed again. Hee hee hee. Maybe he's disguised himself as Carmelita Spatz. Or me, said a voice from the doorway. The Baudelaire's whirled around and saw Coach Genghis standing there with a red nose in his hand and a fierce look in his eyes. Red rose. Red rose in his hand and a fierce look in his eye. Or you, Nero said. <laughs> Imagine this Olaf fellow pretending to be the finest gym teacher in the country. Klaus looked at Coach Genghis and thought of all the trouble he'd cause, whether he was pretending to be Uncle Monty's assistant, Stefano, or Captain Sham, or Shirley, or any of the other phony names that he'd used. Klaus wanted desperately to say, You are Count Olaf! But he knew that if the Baudelaire's pretended that Coach Genghis was fooling them, they had a better chance of revealing his plan, whatever it was. So he bit his tongue, a phrase which here means he simply kept quiet. He did not actually bite his tongue, but opened his mouth and laughed. Ha! That would be funny, he lied. Imagine if you were really Count Olaf. Wouldn't that be funny, Coach Genghis? That would mean that your turban would really be a disguise. My turban, Coach Genghis said. His fierce look melted away as he realized, incorrectly, of course, that Klaus was joking. A disguise! Ha ha ha! He he he! Nero laughed. Violet and Sunny both saw at once what Klaus was doing and followed suit. Oh yes, Genghis, Violet cried as she were joking as if she were joking. Take your turban off and show us the one eyebrow you're hiding. Ha <laughs> ha. You three children are really pretty funny, Nero cried. You're like three professional comedians. Vola socks, Sunny shrieked, showing all four teeth in a fake smile. Yes, Klaus said. Sunny's right. If you were really Olaf in disguise, then your running shoes would be covering your tattoo. Ha <laughs> ha, Nero said. You children are three clowns. Ho ho ho. Count Olaf said. Ha ha ha, Violet said, who was beginning to feel queasy from faking all this laughter. Looking up at Genghis and smiling so hard that her teeth ached, she stood on tiptoe and tried to reach his turban. I'm gonna rip this off, she said as if she were still joking, and show off your one eyebrow. He <laughs> he, Nero said, shaking his pigtails in laughter. You're like three trained monkeys. Klaus crouched down to the ground and grabbed one of Genghis's feet. I'm gonna rip one of your shoes off, he said as if he were still joking. And show off your tattoo! Hee hee hee, Nero said. You're like three... The Baudelaire's didn't get to hear what they were three of, because Coach Genghis stuck out both of his arms, catching Klaus with one hand and Violet with the other. Ho ho ho, he said, and then abruptly stopped laughing. Of course, he said in a tone of voice that was suddenly serious. I can't take off my running shoes because I've been exercising and my feet smell. And I can't take off my turban for religious reasons. Hehe! <laughs> Nero stopped giggling and became very serious himself. Oh, Coach Genghis, he said. We wouldn't ask you to violate your religious beliefs and I certainly don't want your feet stinking up my office. Violet struggled to reach the turban and Klaus struggled to remove one of the evil coach's shoes but Genghis held them both tight. 
Drat, Sunny shrieked. Joke time is over, Nero announced. Thank you for brightening up my morning, children. Goodbye, and enjoy your breakfast without silverware. Now, Coach Genghis, what can I do for you? Well, Nero, Genghis said, I just wanted to give you this rose, a small gift of congratulations for the wonderful concert that you gave us last night. Oh, thank you, Nero said, taking the rose out of Genghis's hand and giving it a good smell. I was wonderful, wasn't I? You were perfection, Genghis said. The first time you played your sonata, I was deeply moved. The second time, I had tears in my eyes. The third time, I was sobbing. The fourth time, I had an uncontrollable emotional attack. The fifth time... The Baudelaire's did not hear about the fifth time because Nero's door swung shut behind them. They looked at one another in dismay. The Baudelaire's had come very close to revealing Coach Genghis's disguise, but close was not enough. They trudged silently out of the administrative building and over to the cafeteria. Evidently, Nero had already called the metal mask cafeteria workers because when Violet and Klaus reached the end of the line, the workers refused to hand them any silverware. Prufrock Prep was not serving oatmeal for breakfast, but Violet and Klaus knew that eating scrambled eggs with their hands was not going to be very pleasant. Oh, don't worry about that, Isadora said when the children slid glumly into seats beside the quagmires. Here, Klaus and I will take turns with my silverware and you can share with Duncan, Violet. Tell us how everything went in Nero's office. Not very well, Violet admitted. Coach Genghis got there right after we did, and we didn't want him to see that we knew who he really was. Isadora pulled her notebook out of her pocket and read out loud to her friends. It would be a stroke of luck if Coach Genghis were hit by a truck, she read. That's my latest poem. I know it's not that helpful, but I thought you might like to hear it anyway. I did like hearing it, Klaus said, and it certainly would be a stroke of luck if that happened, but I wouldn't bet on it. Well, we'll think of another plan, Duncan said, handing Violet his fork. I hope so, Violet said. Count Olaf doesn't usually wait very long to put his evil schemes into action. Cosbull, Sunny shrieked. Does Sunny mean I have a plan, Isadora said. I'm trying to get the hang of her way of talking. I think she means something more like, here comes Carmelita Spatz, Klaus said, pointing across the cafeteria. Sure enough, Carmelita Spatz was walking toward their table with a big smug smile on her face. Hello, you cake sniffers, she said. I've got a message from you for you from Coach Genghis. I get to be his special messenger because I'm the prettiest, cutest, nicest girl in the whole school. Stop bragging, Carmelita, Duncan said. You're just jealous, Carmelita replied, because Go Coach Genghis likes me best instead of you. I couldn't care less about Coach Genghis, Duncan said. Just deliver your message and leave us alone. The message is this, Carmelita said. The three Baudelaire orphans are to report to the front lawn tonight immediately after dinner. After dinner, Violet said, but after dinner we're supposed to go to Nero's violin recital. That's the message, Carmelita insisted. He said if you don't show up, you'll be in big trouble, so if I were you, Violet... You aren't Violet, thank goodness, Duncan interrupted. It's not very polite to interrupt a person, of course, but sometimes if the person is very unpleasant, you could hardly stop yourself. Thank you for your message. Goodbye. It is traditional, Carmelita said, to give a special messenger a tip after she has delivered a message. If you don't leave us alone, Isadora said, you're going to get a head full of scrambled eggs as your tip. You're just a jealous cake sniffer, Carmelita sneered, but she left the Baudelaire's and Quagmire's alone. Don't worry, Duncan said when he was sure Carmelita couldn't hear him. It's still morning. We have all day to figure out what to do. Here, have another spoonful of eggs, Violet. No, thank you, Violet said. I don't really have much of an appetite. And it was true. None of the Baudelaire's had an appetite. Scrambled eggs had never been the si sibling's favorite dish, particularly Sunny, who much preferred food who she could really sink her teeth into. But their lack of appetite had nothing to do with the eggs. It had to do with Coach Genghis, of course, and the message that he had sent to them. It had to do with the thought of meeting him on the lawn after dinner all alone. Duncan was right that it was still morning, and that they all they had all day to figure out what to do, but it did not feel like morning. Violet, Klaus, and Sunny sat in the cafeteria, not taking another bite of their breakfast, and it felt the sun had already set. It felt as if the night had already fallen, and that Coach Genghis was already waiting for them. It was only morning, and the Baudelaire orphans already felt like they were in his clutches. That's the end of chapter six. Catch up.
It's a lake. Pancakes. <laughs> Beanbag chair. Don't tell Rob, but no, that's not true at all. Rob has wonderful streams. And I hope that I, I one day can match the level of stream greatness that we get from Goodnight Gojira. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, you're leaving to watch SpongeBob? Rude not Dan. Rut row foreshadowing. Thank you for the follow, Dark. Welcome to the channel. You show lion you. You're all amazing streamers. True dat. Hello. Hello, MMA fighter. I hope you're having a good night tonight. Oh, hi, Terror. Thank you for being here. I'm new here. You're the Super Bowl for me, so don't let you. Well, if you like reading stories, or if you like being read to, then you found the right place. But welcome to the channel. <clears throat> Hope you're having a good night. Hello, Sadie. I am streaming. Can I help you? No, you can't have that. There's chocolate on it. It will hurt you. Okay, Sadie. Time to leave. Time to leave. Time to leave. Time to leave. Get out. Thank you. <laughs> you definitely, you deserve all the shout outs, Terror. Mm. Yeah, how about three? How about three? <laughs> there's, there's just gonna be a shout out battle happening in my chat the whole time I'm reading chapter seven. I'm glad you're here, Tara, for what it's worth, and you have great streams, so don't sass me anymore, because I'm right about this. No, you can sass me, obviously, but I'm right about this, and everybody else would agree. <laughs> nope. Yeah, that's true. Thank you, Riddy. I appreciate you, or, yeah, okay, thank you, Tara, for taking care of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nope. <clears throat> Thank you, mods, for taking care of everything. I have best mods. And with that being said, I'm moving on to chapter seven. Chapter seven! The Baudelaire Orphan School Day was particularly austere, a word which here means that Mr. Ramora's storings were particularly boring, Mrs. Bass's obsession with the metric system was particularly irritating, not interesting, irritating, and Nira's administrative demands were particularly difficult, but Violet, Klaus, and Sunny did not really notice. Violet sat at her school desk, and anybody who did not know Violet would have thought that she was paying close attention, because her hair was tied up in a ribbon to keep it out of her eyes. But Violet's thoughts were far, far away from the dull tales that Mr. Ramora was telling. She had tried, tied her hair up, of course, to help focus her keen inventing brain on the problem she, that was facing the Baudelaire's, and she didn't want to waste an ounce of her attention on the rambling, banana-eating man in the front of the room. Mrs. Bass had brought in a box of pencils for her class and was having them figure out if one of them was any longer or shorter than the rest. And if Mrs. Bass wasn't being, weren't so busy pacing around the room shouting, MEASURE! She might have looked at Klaus and thought that perhaps he shared her obsession with measurement because his eyes were sharply focused as if he were concentrating. But Klaus was spending the morning on autopilot, a word which here means measuring pencils without really thinking about them. As he placed pencil after pencil next to his ruler, he was thinking of books he had read that might be helpful for their situation. 
And if Vice Principal Nero had stopped practicing his violin and looked in on his infant secretary, he would have guessed that Sonny was working very hard, mailing letters he had dictated to various candy companies complaining about their candy quality. But even though Sunny was typing, stapling, and stamping as quickly as she could, her mind was not on secretarial supplies, but on the appointments she and her siblings had with Coach Genghis that evening and what they could do about it. The Quagmires were curiously absent from lunch, so the Baudelaire's were really forced to eat with their hands this time, but as they picked up handfuls of spaghetti and tried to eat them as neatly as possible, the three children were thinking so hard that they barely spoke. They knew, almost without discussing the matter, that none of them had been able to guess coach Genghis's plan and that they hadn't figured out a way to avoid their appointment with him on the lawn an appointment that drew closer and closer with every handful of lunch the Baudelaire's passed the afternoon in more or less the same way ignoring Mr. Ramora's stories Mrs. Bass's pencils and the diminishing supply of staples and even during gym period one of Carmelita's bratty friends informed them that Genghis would start teaching the next day but in the meantime they were to run around as usual the three children raced around the lawn in utter silence, devoting all of their brain power to thinking about their situation. The Baudelaire's had been so very quiet and thinking so very hard that when the Quagmire sat down across from them at dinner time and said in unison, we've solved your problem, it was more of a startle than a relief. Goodness, Vila said, you startled me. I thought you'd be relieved, Duncan said. Didn't you hear us? We said we solved your problem. We're startled and relieved, Klaus said. What do you mean you've solved our problem? My sisters and I have been thinking about this all day and we've gotten nowhere. We don't know what Coach Genghis is up to, although we're sure he's up to something. And we don't know how we can avoid meeting him after dinner, although we're sure he'll do something terrible if we do. At first I thought he might simply be planning to kidnap us, Violet said, but he wouldn't have to be in disguise to do that. And at first I thought we should call Mr. Poe, after all, Klaus said and tell him what's going on, but if Count Olaf can fool an advanced computer, he'll surely, surely be able to fool that average banker. Teresia, Sonny said in agreement. Duncan and I have been thinking about it all day too, Isadora said. I filled up five and a half pages of my notebook writing down possible ideas, and Duncan filled up three. I write smaller, Duncan explained, handing his fork to Violet so she could take her turn at the meatloaf they were having for dinner. Right before lunch, we compared notes, Isadora continued, and the two of us had the same idea. So we snuck away, and we put our plan into action. That's why we weren't at lunch, Duncan explained. You'll notice there are puddles of beverages on our trays instead of glasses. Well, you can share our glasses, Klaus said, handing his to Isadora. Just like you're letting us share your silverware. But what is your plan? What did you put into action? Duncan and Isadora looked at one another, smiled, and leaned in close to the Baudelaire so they would be sure no one would overhear. We propped open the back door of the auditorium, Duncan said. He and Isadora smiled triumphantly and leaned back in their chairs. The Baudelaire's did not seem triumphant, feel triumphant. They felt confused. They did not want to insult their friends who had broken the rules and sacrificed their drinking glasses just to help them, but they were unable to see how propping open the back door of the auditorium was a solution to the trouble in which they found themselves. I'm sorry, Violet said after a pause. I don't understand how propping open the back door of the auditorium solves our problem. Don't you see? Isadora said. We're going to sit in the back of the auditorium tonight, and as soon as Nero begins his concert, we will tiptoe out and sneak over to the front lawn. That way we can keep an eye on you and Coach Genghis. If anything fishy happens, we'll run back to the concert and alert Vi Vice Principal Nero. It's the perfect plan, don't you think? Duncan said. I'm rather proud of my sister and me, if I do say so myself. The Baudelaire children looked at one another doubtfully. They didn't want to disappoint their friends or criticize the plan that the Quagmire triplets had cooked up, particularly since the Baudelaire's hadn't cooked up any plan themselves. But Count Olaf was so evil and so clever that the three siblings couldn't help but think that propping a door open and sneaking out to spy on him was not much of a defense against his treachery. We appreciate you trying to solve our problem, Klaus said gently, but Count Olaf is an extremely treacherous person. He always has something up his sleeve. I wouldn't want you to get in, into any danger on our behalf. Don't talk nonsense, Isadora said firmly, taking a sip from Violet's glass. You're the ones in danger, and it's up to us to help you. And we're not frightened of Olaf. I'm confident this plan is a good one. The Baudelaire's looked at one another again. 
It was very brave of the Quagmire triplets not to be frightened of Olaf and to be so confident about their plan, but the three siblings could not help but wonder if the Quagmires should be so brave. Olaf was a wretched man that it seemed... Olaf was such a wretched man that it seemed wise to be frightened of him, and he had defeated so many of the Baudelaire's plans that it seemed a little foolish to be so confident about this one. But the children were so appreciative of their friend's efforts that they said nothing more about the matter. In the years to come, the Baudelaire orphans would regret this, this time when they said nothing more about the matter, but in the meantime, they merely finished their dinner with the Quagmires, passing silverware and drinking glasses back and forth, and trying to talk about other things. They discussed other projects they might do to improve the, the orphan shack, and what other matters they might research in the library, and what they could do about Sunny's problem with the staples, which were running out quite rapidly, and before they knew it, dinner was over. The Quagmires hurried off to the violin recital, promising to sneak out as quickly as they could, and the Baudelaire's walked out of the cafeteria and over to the front lawn. The last few rays of the sunset made the children cast long, long shadows as they walked, as if the Baudelaire's had been stretched across the brown grass by some horrible mechanical device. The children looked down at their shadows, which looked as flimsy as sheets of paper, and wished with every step that they could do something else, anything else, other than meet Coach Genghis alone on the front lawn. They wished they could just keep walking, under the arch, past the front lawn, and out into the world, but where would they go? The three orphans were all alone in this world. Their parents were dead, their banker was too busy to take good care of them, and their only friends were two more orphans, who the Baudelaire sincerely hoped had snuck out of the recital by now and were spying on them as they approached the solitary figure of Coach Genghis, waiting for them impatiently on the edge of the lawn. The waning light of the sunset, the word waning here means dim and making everything look extra creepy, made the shadow of the coach's turban look like a large, deep hole. You're late, C Genghis said in his scratchy voice. As the siblings reached him, they could see he had both hands behind his back as if he were hiding something. Your instructions were to be here right after dinner, and you're late. We're very sorry, Violet said, craning her neck to try to catch a glimpse of what was behind his back. It took us a little longer to eat our dinner without silverware. If you were smart, Genghis said, you would have borrowed the silverware of one of your friends. We never thought of that, Klaus said. When one is forced to tell atrocious lies, one often feels a guilty flutter in one's stomach, and Klaus felt such a flutter now. You certainly are an intelligent man, he continued. Not only am I intelligent, Genghis agreed, but I'm also very smart. Now let's get right to work. Even stupid children like yourselves should remember what I said about orphans having excellent bone structure for running. So that's why you are about to do special orphan running exercises, or SORE for short. Ooh la do, Sunny shrieked. My sister means uh, that's very exciting, Violet said, although Ula do actually meant I wish you'd tell us what you're really up to, Genghis. I'm glad you're so enthusiastic, Genghis said. In certain cases, enthusiasm can make up for a lack of brain power. He took his hands from behind his back and the children saw that he was holding a large metal can and a long prickly brush. The can was open and an eerie white glow was shining out of the top. Now before we begin soar, we'll need a track. This is luminous paint, which means it glows in the dark. How interesting, Klaus said, although he'd known what the word luminous means for two and a half years. Well, if you find it so interesting, Genghis said, his eyes looking as luminous as the paint, you can be in charge of the bush brush. Here. He thrust the long prickly brush into Klaus's hands. And you little girls can hold the paint can. I want you to paint a big circle on the grass so you can see where you are running when you start your laps. Go on, what are you waiting for? The Baudelaire's looked at one another. What they were waiting for, of course, was Genghis revealing what he was really up to with the paint, the brush, and the ridiculous special orphans running exercises. But in the meantime, they figured they'd better do as Genghis said. Painting a big, luminous circle on the lawn didn't seem to be particularly dangerous, so Violet picked up the paint can, and Klaus dipped the brush into the paint and began making a big circle. For the moment, Sunny was something of a fifth wheel, a phrase which means not in a position to do much of anything particularly helpful. But she crawled alongside her siblings, offering her moral support. Bigger! Genghis called out in the dark. Wider! The Baudelaire's followed his instructions and made the circle bigger and wider, walking farther away from Genghis and leaving a glowing trail of paint. 
They looked out into the gloom of the evening, wondering where the Quagmire triplets were hiding, or if indeed they had managed to sneak out of the recital at all. But the sun was down now, and the only thing the orphans could see was the bright circle of light they were painting on the lawn and the dim figure of Genghis, his white turban looking like a floating skull in the night. Bigger! Wider! All right, all right, that's big and wide enough. Finish the circle where I'm standing. What do you think we're really doing? Violet whispered to her brother. I don't know, Klaus said. I've only read three or four books on paint. I, I know that paint can sometimes be poisonous or cause birth defects. But uh, Genghis isn't making us eat the circle, and you're not pregnant, of course, so I can't really imagine. Sunny wanted to add Garbaga, which meant maybe the luminous paint is serving as some sort of glowing signal. But the Bodlers had come full circle and were too close to Genghis to do any more talking. I suppose that will do, orphans, Genghis said, snatching the brush and the can of paint out of their hands. Now take your marks, and when I blow my whistle, begin running around the circle you've made till I tell you to stop. What? Violet said. As I'm sure you know, there are two types of what in the world. The first type simply means, excuse me, I didn't hear you. Could you repeat yourself? The second type's a little trickier. It means something more along the lines of, excuse me, I did hear you, but I can't believe that's really what you meant. And this second type is obviously the type Violet was using at this moment. She was standing right next to Genghis, so she'd obviously heard what, he, what had come out of the smelly mouth of this miserable man. But she couldn't believe that Genghis was simply going to make them run laps. He was such a sneaky and revolting person that the eldest Baudelaire simply could not accept that his scheme was only as evil as the average gym class. What? Genghis repeated in a mocking way. He'd obviously taken a page out of Nero's book, a phrase which here means learn how to repeat things in a mocking way in order to make fun of children. I know you heard me, little orphan girl. You're standing right next to me. Now take your marks, all of you, and begin running as soon as I blow my whistle. But Sonny's a baby, Klaus protested. She can't really run, at least not professionally. Then she may crawl as fast as she can, Genghis replied. Now on your marks, get set, go! Genghis blew his whistle, and the Bodler orphans began to run, pacing themselves so they could run together even though they had different sized legs. They finished one lap, and then another, and then another, and another, and then five more, and then another, and then seven more, and then another, and then three more, and then two more, and then another, and then another, and then six more, and then they lost track. Coach Genghis kept blowing his whistle and occasionally shouted tedious or unhelpful things like keep running or another lap. The children looked down at the luminous circle so they could stay in a circle, and the children looked over at Genghis as he grew fainter and then clearer as they finished a lap, and the children looked out into the darkness to see if they could catch a glimpse of the quagmires. The Bodlers also looked at one another from time to time, and, but they didn't speak, not even when they were far enough away from Genghis that he could not overhear. One reason they did not speak was to conserve energy, because although the Bodlers were in reasonably good shape, they had not run so many live laps in their lives, and before too long they were breathing too hard to really discuss anything. But the other reason they did not speak was that Violet who had already spoken for them when she had asked the second type of what. Coach Genghis kept blowing his whistle and the children kept running around and around the track and echoing in each of their minds was this second trickier type of question. The three siblings had heard Coach Genghis, but they couldn't believe that Sore was the extent of his evil plan. The Baudelaire orphans kept running around the glowing circle until the first rays of sunrise began to reflect on the jewel in Genghis's turban, and all they could think was, what? 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 End of chapter 7. Let me catch up. No. Don't get lost in snow and fireworks. Where, what's fireworks? Oh, Super Bowl. Duh. You could send some snow down here. Ooh, root beer float. I'm never safe, Riddy. It's a miracle I've avoided injuries. <laughs> Please be careful for us. You have snow too? Ooh, swollen toe. Oh, thank you for clipping something. <laughs> I'll have to watch this. I'm sure you'll post it in Discord or send it to me as you do because you're great like that. Oh, you're welcome for streaming. I'm glad you're here, even if you're just listening. A six-foot cage full of juice over your toe? Owie. 
Be back in a jiffy. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. I just clapped for myself. That was... I was clapping for Riddy. <laughs> clapping for Riddy because Riddy is amazing. That's what was happening. For sure. So... I'm trying to figure out if I want to... You did put it in Discord. Perfect. Um... Totally. Should I do one more chapter or two? Uh, I'm only at an hour. I just knocked out three chapters in an hour. I feel like I could possibly do two more. Hmm. Well, at least I'm going to read one more, so I might as well get into that. This is Donkey Kang music. I know this because I watched Terror play it. Thank you, Kang. I apologize that I'm really, really weird, friends. I'm sorry. Also, my microphone is right here off of camera, which is why that you're just seeing my eyeball. Okay. <clears throat> I feel like my hair looks goofy. Well, that's nice of you, ready? Okay. <coughs> that was probably real loud. I'm sorry. Chapter 8! What? Isadora asked. I said, finally as the sun rose, Coach Genghis had us stop running laps and let us go to bed, Klaus said. My sister didn't mean she didn't hear you, Duncan explained. She meant that she heard you, but she didn't really believe that's what you meant. And to tell you the truth, I can scarcely believe it myself, even though I saw it with my own eyes. I can't believe it either, Violet said, wincing as she took a bite of the salad that was that the masked people had served for lunch. It was the next afternoon, and all three Baudelaire orphans were doing a great deal of wincing, a word which here means frowning in pain, alarm, or distress. When Coach Genghis had called last night's activity sore... He had merely used the name as an acronym for Special Orphans Running Exercises, but the three children thought that the name SOAR was even more appropriate than that. After a full night of SOAR, they'd been sore all day. Their legs were sore from all that running. When they'd finally entered the orphan shack to go to sleep, they had been too tired to put on their noisy shoes, so their toes were sore from the claws of the tiny territorial crabs. And their heads were sore not only from headaches, which often occur when one doesn't get enough sleep, but also from trying to figure out what coat <laughs> And their heads were sore, not only from headaches, which often occur when one doesn't get enough sleep, but also from trying to figure out what Coach Genghis was up to in making them run all those laps. The Baudelaire legs were sore, the Baudelaire toes were sore, the Baudelaire heads were sore, and soon the muscles on the sides of the Baudelaire's mouths would be sore from wincing all day. It was lunchtime, and the three children were trying to discuss the previous evening with the quagmire triplets who weren't very sore and not nearly as tired. One reason was that they had been hiding behind the archway, spying on Genghis and the Baudelaire's instead of running around and around the luminous circle. The other reason was that the quagmires had done their spying in shifts. After the Baudelaire's had run the first few laps and there was no sign of them stopping, the two triplets had decided to alternate between Duncan sleeping and Isadora spying, and Duncan spying and Isadora sleeping. The two siblings promised one, one another that they would wake up the sleeping one if the spying one noticed anything unusual. I had the last shift, Duncan explained, so my sister didn't see the end of sore, but it doesn't matter. All that happened was that Coach Gungus, Gingus had you stop running laps and let you go to bed. I thought he might insist on getting your fortune before you could stop running. And I thought that the luminous circle would serve as a landing strip, Isadora said, for a helicopter piloted by one of his assistants to swoop down and take you away. The only thing I couldn't figure out was why you had to run all those laps before the helicopter showed up. But the helicopter didn't show up, Klaus said, taking a sip of water and wincing. Nothing showed up. Maybe the pilot got lost, Isadora said. Or maybe Coach Genghis became as tired as you did and forgot to ask for your fortune, Duncan said. Violet shook her sore head. <clears throat> he would never get too tired to get our fortune, she said. He's up to something that much is for sure, but I just can't figure out what it is. 
Of course you can't figure it out, Duncan said. You're exhausted. I'm glad Isadora and I thought of spying in shifts. We're going to use all of our spare time to investigate this. We'll go through all of our notes and we'll do some more research in the library. There's got to be something that can help us figure it out. I'll do research too, Klaus said, yawning. I'm quite good at it. <sighs> Sorry. I know you are, Isadora said, smiling. But not today, Klaus. We'll work on uncovering Genghis's plan and you three can catch up on your sleep. You're too tired to do much good in the library or anywhere else. Violet and Klaus looked at each other's tired faces and then down at their baby sister, and they saw that the quagmire triplets were right. Violet had been so tired that she had only taken a few notes on Mr. Remora's painfully dull stories. Klaus had been so tired that he had incorrectly measured nearly all of Mrs. Bass's objects. And although Sunny had not reported what she had done that morning in Nero's office, she couldn't have been a very good administrative assistant because she'd fallen asleep right there in the cafeteria, her little head on her salad, as if it were a soft pillow instead of leaves of lettuce, slices of tomato, gobs of creamy honey mustard dressing, and crispy croutons, which are small toasted pieces of bread that give a salad some added crunch. <laughs> Violet... <laughs> Violet gently lifted her sister's head out of the salad and shook a few croutons out of her hair. Sunny winced and made a faint, miserable noise and went back to sleep in Violet's lap. Perhaps you're right, Isadora, Violet said. We'll stumble through the afternoon somehow and get a good night's sleep tonight. If we're lucky, Vice Principal Nero will play something quiet at tonight's concert and we can sleep through that as well. You can see with that last sentence just how tired Violet really was because if we're lucky is not a phrase that she or either of her siblings used very often. The reason, of course, is quite clear. Vodler orphans were not lucky. Smart? Yes. Charming? Yes. Able to survive austere situations? Yes. But the children were not lucky, and so wouldn't use the phrase if we're lucky any more than they would use the phrase if we're stalks of celery, because neither phrase was appropriate. If the Bodler orphans had been stalks of celery, they would not have been small children in great distress, and if they had been lucky, Carmelita Spatz would not have approached their table at this particular moment and delivered another unfortunate message. Hello, you cake sniffers, she said, although judging from the baby brat, you're more like salad sniffers. I have another message for you from Coach Genghis. I get to be his special messenger because I'm the cutest, prettiest, nicest little girl in the whole school. If you were really the nicest person in the whole school, Isadora said, you wouldn't be making fun of a sleeping infant. But never mind, what's the message? It's actually the same one as last time, Carmelita said, but I'll repeat it in case you're too stupid to remember. The Baudelaire orphans are to report to the front lawn tonight immediately after dinner. What? Klaus asked. Are you deaf as well as cake sniffy? Carmelita asked. I said... Yes, Klaus heard you, Isadora said quickly. He didn't mean that kind of what. We've received the message, Carmelita, now go away. That's two tips you owe me, Carmelita said, but she did flounce off. I can't believe it, Violet said. Not more laps. My legs are almost too sore to walk, let alone run. Carmelita didn't say anything about more laps, Duncan pointed out. Maybe Coach Genghis is putting his real plan into action tonight. In any case, we'll sneak out of the recital again and keep an eye on you. In shifts, Isadora added, nodding in agreement. And I bet we'll have a clear picture of his plan by then. We have the rest of the day to do research. Isadora paused and flipped open her black notebook to the right page. She read, Don't worry, Baudelaire's. Don't feel disgraced. The quagmire triplets are on the case. Thank you, Klaus said, giving Isadora a tired smile of appreciation. My sisters and I are thankful for all your help, and we're going to put our minds to the problem even though we're too exhausted to do research. If we're lucky, all of us working together can defeat Coach Genghis. There was that phrase again, if we're lucky, coming out of the mouth of a Baudelaire, and once again it was about as appropriate as if we're stalks of celery. The only difference was that the Baudelaire orphans did not wish to be stalks of celery. While it is true that if they were stalks of celery, they would not be orphans because celery is a plant and so cannot really be said to have parents, Violet, Klaus, and Sunny did not wish to be the stringy, low-calorie vegetable. Unfortunate things can happen to celery as easily as they can happen to children. Celery can be sliced into small pieces and dipped into clam dip at fancy parties. It can be coated in peanut butter and served as a snack. It can merely sit in a field and rot away if the nearby celery farmers are lazy or on vacation. 
All these terrible things can happen to celery, and the orphans knew it. So if you were to ask the Baudelaire's if they wanted to be stalks of celery, they would say, of course not. But they did want to be lucky. The Baudelaire's did not necessarily want to be extremely lucky, like someone who finds a treasure map or someone who wins a lifetime supply of ice cream in a contest, or like the man, and not, alas, me, who was lucky enough to marry my beloved Beatrice and live with her in happiness over the course of her short life. But the Baudelaire's wanted to be lucky enough. They wanted to be lucky enough to figure out how to escape Coach Genghis's clutches, and it seemed that being lucky would be their only chance. Violet was too tired to invent anything, and Klaus was too tired to read anything, and Sunny, still asleep in Violet's lap, was too tired to bite anything or anybody. And it seemed that even with the diligence of the Quagmire triplets, the word diligence here means ability to take good notes in dark green and pitch black notebooks, they needed to be lucky if they wanted to stay alive. The Baudelaire's huddled together as if the cafeteria were extremely cold, wincing in soreness and in worry. They seemed, it seemed to the Baudelaire orphans that they wanted to be lucky more than they had in their entire lives. End of chapter 8. Catching up. Words are difficult. Yeah, I had a minute there. Oh, are you going... Are you going to bed? Or are you here, Stuart? I'm confused. I hope you... I, hope, I mean, the floor is kind of comfy. Oh, they were sliding on the slush. Oh, little puppy. Snapchat a riot. His own, uh, thank you for the standing ovations. On your head! Whoa! <laughs> You're unbeatable! Well, welcome to bed. So, I'm thinking I might... I know this is this was such a short stream. Um, but I'm thinking I might call it here, um, just because I do have to get up in the morning for work. Um, and then the next time I read this, I can finish the book out reading the last five chapters. I'll read chapters 9 to 13. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah, five chapters. Hey, V! Hey, Stuart! Oh, slumber party at Stuart's house. Yeah, guys, I think I'm going to call it here. Thank you for um, for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed. I hope it was relaxing. I'm sorry it wasn't super long, um, but I just wanted to get a little bit more story progress done. Um, I'm probably just going to spend the rest of my night chilling in my PJs and um, uploading past streams to YouTube because I'm a little bit behind on that. But other than that, have a wonderful, wonderful night, friends. Thank you again so much for being here. Um, I'm going to leave you with a little bit of music, but other than that, I will see you guys very soon. Take care of yourselves as always, and of course, much love from me to you. I'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>